I hope that today I can uh, give you an overview of uh, the the work that we that we did uh, in our research activities on secondary plant uh, metabolites, and uh, I, I would uh, especially highlight uh, the the cross disciplinary um, character of of uh, secondary plant metabolites that uh, does not only include food science in a in a stricter sense, but that may expand also to disciplines um, that uh, are of interest to to um, the Phenorop cluster of of excellence. I know that many of you have a plant science background, but not everybody. And so um, let me start with with uh, this slide that I, um, this photo that I took some uh, years ago in southern Germany. You see these horses uh, grazing on their paddock and there are areas that are not touched, uh, that are um, um, populated by the so-called yellow buttercup. Yeah? And so the question is, uh, why is this uh, the the case? Um, before we go into the solution uh, to this question, um, I would like uh, to to differentiate between the the opportunities that animals or we as human beings have um, to escape or fight stress um, and uh, the opportunities that plants have. So uh, we may be uh, attacked by by insects. Uh, we uh, may have to do with with pests, predators. Uh, we, as as mobile um, human beings or animals, we we can escape. We can uh, fight back. We can use um, repellents. Plants are sessile. They are immobile. They they cannot escape. You know, once they are in in the ground, they usually stay there for the rest of of their life. So they have to find different. Um, strategies to to fight uh, uh, these these uh, stresses, so they can be biosynthesized toxins, bitter compounds, enzyme inhibitors, and was and whatnot. Uh, microbial infestation may be a big problem. Problem we uh, may activate our immune system, or if nothing helps, antibiotics may do. Uh, plants uh, they produce antimicrobially active compounds, and in case of excessive sunlight, uh, we can seek shadow. We can wear appropriate clothing or we can use sunscreens. Um, plants can't. They have to come up with their own uh, sunscreen and uh, this is uh, UV absorbing um, compounds. So um, coming back to, to these horses, uh, the uh, yellow buttercup contains uh, a compound which is called ranunculine. And uh, in, in case uh, an animal a horse is is chewing uh, this this buttercup. Uh, the disintegration of uh, the plant tissue triggers enzymatic and later also chemical reactions that finally lead to the formation of protoanemonin, which has an unpleasant, uh, pungent uh, taste. It can uh, cause mouth pain and uh, blisters, yeah, and and several other issues. So um, we see that that plants. Um, um, biosynthesized compounds that helps them survive against all types of of stresses and um, um, it's hard to find uh, reliable data on on the number of secondary plant metabolites the, the number is huge um, according to a to a review from uh, Wink, uh, it's estimated at 200 uh, thousands uh, some years um, ago so it protects from herbivores it has they have many of them have antimicrobial activity, uh, provide uh, UV protection or protection from oxidation. Um, on the other side, they may attract pollinators, frugivores, they aid in, in communication, they uh, uh, may serve as uh, nitrogen storage compounds, and they are also of chemotaxonomic um, relevance, as we, we will see in a minute. Uh, the number of, of, of structures uh, that is broken down here um, is probably also an, a, a rough um, guess. Uh, in foods, um, secondary plant metabolites have uh, uh, an immense role. Um, they are quality determining compounds in many plant derived foods. Uh, just take lycopene in, in tomatoes, um, flavor um, compounds, uh, taste active compounds like capsaicin in, in chilies. They may um, aid to, to texture, to, to stability, and uh, they may also be. Um, health promoting, um, which has been shown for, for many um, individual compounds. Um, now, 
as a food scientist, um, I should certainly come up with some some trends uh, that we have observed um, in the food sector. First, sustainability um, has turned into an area that is really, really important, uh, not only at the University of Bonn and, and at the Cluster of Excellence, um, also in the food industry. And uh, sustainability has, has uh, frequently not always been associated with strategies that that avoid or at least minimize uh, food waste side streams. Um, second, um, we see that uh, synthetic additives, synthetic colorants um, and, and, and uh, preservatives, antioxidants are increasingly rejected by consumers. So this means there is, there is a, a huge pull uh, for ingredients uh, from natural sources, preferably, of course, um, plant derived, not animal derived. And there is also an increased awareness by the consumers of the relationship between nutrition and health. And, uh, and all this has triggered an intense research on secondary plant metabolites on one side, but for example, also on dietary fiber. And I shouldn't uh, neglect that there is an, an ever increasing importance of food safety, um, which is inevitably um, combined with food authenticity. So what you see is um, secondary plant metabolites are important. Yeah? They are important not only for food science, also in nutrition, of course, in plant science. And it may extend also to animal science. I will show you an example uh, later on and take the highlighted um, um, circles here. This, this is pretty much the faculty of agriculture. No, but it's obviously also important for pharmacy and, and um, medicine. Um, you will not be surprised that, that uh, many of these areas uh, are core um, fields in, in our um, research. Uh, reactions of phenolic compounds, uh, recovery uh, of, of valuable compounds from uh, side streams, profiling, authentication of plant-derived foods, also effects of processing on, on the stability and, and bioavailability of uh, secondary plant metabolites. Here we have a, a clear relationship to uh, nutritional um, sciences. Um, the fact that we can do this um, is based not only, but to a, to a large degree on, on our equipment. Uh, and uh, when, when I say on our equipment, I uh, include my colleague, Matthias, who is, who is also um, part of this project, um, this open call project in, in Finorop. So we uh, have, I think, quite a good um, analytical equipment, uh, including mass spect spectrometers uh, to analyze uh, non-volatile compounds uh, such as uh, polyphenols and carotenoids on our side and especially um, analyze also volatile compounds in, in um, Matthias's group. And we have also the equipment uh, that helps us uh, to, to prepare samples, isolate compounds for uh, structure elucidation and determination of their bioactivities. Um, just as a, as a brief insight um, into, uh, in, into profiling and authentication, um, we have been uh, working on the analytical side of, of things for quite some time. And uh, you can use um, phenolic compounds, but also other compounds as markers of authenticity. And uh, there have been already dogmatic views about the presence of certain um, compounds in certain plants. Uh, what we could show for the first time is that uh, this peak, it, it refers to fluorescein, that this um, compound occurs in, in um, strawberries and in uh, Costa Rican guavas. Uh, fluorescein has long been thought to be exclusively present in apples. No? So any uh, detection of fluorescein in in these uh, uh, fruits does not necessarily mean that that uh, in the products uh, apple uh, cheap apple products have been added likewise uh, we we uh, detected an isoremnetine glycoside in in an apple fruit um, isoremnetine glycosides have been um, uh, considered uh, key markers uh, for the addition of of pear juice uh, to to apple juice now uh, this view can no longer be um, kept up. And we also um, detect, 
or, or established uh, methods for the differentiation of uh, uh, blueberry, bilberry uh, fruits, which is of huge economic interest because they differ largely in, in their costs. Another example that um, extends to chemotaxonomy uh, is our work on uh, uh, Anacardia seas plants, mango, um, chocote, a Costa Rican fruit, and also Brazilian um, pepper tree. Um, they all belong to, to this particular um, family. And what we saw is that there is an unusual uh, presence of seven med uh, medoxy uh, flavonoids. Yeah, here, uh, this, is, this is remnantine. And uh, these are two different um, anthocyanins, uh, the, the red uh, flavillium uh, uh, dyes that are present in many, in many plants. So this is unusual. Usually you have uh, an OH group, not, not a medoxylated um, group um, here. So uh, it would be of interest to, to determine whether this is uh, a general trait of uh, Anacardia CS plants. Um, Coming to the to the uh, question that that Heiner um, addressed in his uh, introduction, um, one of our core areas is the uh, valorization of side streams of food processing. As a, and and uh, I will show you that there are many um, bioactive and technologically valuable compounds, uh, especially in. Uh, these side streams. Um, as you probably know, um, bioactive compounds uh, that help plants uh, fight abiotic and, and biotic stress, um, they are localized predominantly here in the outer layers um, or in the uh, reproductive um, tissues. And these are exactly the parts that are removed during processing by peeling after pressing uh, when you, when you um, uh, produce juices. Yeah. So you have a kind of pre-concentration of these valuable compounds uh, in these side streams. Yeah. They em emerge in, in really huge quantities, uh, tens of millions um, of tons, uh, for example, in the case of, of grapes. Yeah. We have mango kernels and peels, we have potato and onion peels, cereal brands, uh, this is this is all uh, uh, typical examples of uh, these um, side streams. Uh, I would like to to start with with a, a, an investigation on on mango kernels. Um, um, almost no more than than twenty years ago, a Japanese group reported antimicrobial activities of mango kernel extracts, and they were unable to identify the active compounds. Four years later, uh, we saw that uh, we obtained pretty much the same chromatogram that uh, these compounds that the Japanese group um, uh, indicated as, as antimicrobially um, active um, are hydrolyzable tenants. So we need, needed to, to bring these two um, pieces of evidence uh, together and, and uh, we uh, did uh, um, some collaborative work with, with a microbiologist uh, when I was in, in Canada isolated these uh, compounds and we saw that they more or less uh, strongly inhibited um, certain um, bacteria. And uh, what was especially uh, striking is that, that uh, lactobacilli were not at all um, uh, affected by, by these um, gallotannins. Yeah. We, we saw that uh, some bacillus uh, species, Listeria, Staphylococci, uh, were affected, Campylobacter, Yersinia, uh, and lactic acid bacteria, they were not, not at all impressed by, by the presence of these uh, gallotannins. What, and uh, this can be, uh, can be explained by the fact that uh, the, the uh, gallotannins, they complex um, iron, uh, which many bacteria need, but not lactic acid bacteria. So iron can antagonize the, the antimicrobial um, activity of uh, gallotannins. And since the lactic acid bacteria do not uh, need uh, iron, uh, they can survive even in the, in the presence of uh, these gallotannins. Uh, this is uh, a microscopic uh, representation of uh, uh, Bacillus subtilis. Uh, we wanted to see how uh, the, the cell morphology um, differs when you when you uh, grow uh, Bacillus subtilis in 
in the presence of gallotannins and and uh, in in the absence. This is the normal cell growth, you know, with with uh, regularly uh, shaped uh, bacillus cells, and uh, you see here the the uh, bacilli they are in a really bad shape. Um, they have lost uh, their ability to to divide, yeah, and uh, so the 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 cells are elongated to a, to a multiple of their of their actual size. Yeah, this is what uh, gallotannins do to this uh, to to this particular um, strain. Another subclass of uh, Phenolic compounds are phenolic lipids, so-called alkyl resorcinols or alkanyl resorcinols, depending on uh, the presence or absence of uh, double bonds. They are characteristic um, also for the uh, before mentioned Anacardia C, but also for the uh, Poesia family, um, that is uh, cereals. Yeah. Um, the the uh, side chains may differ. The, the resorcinol basic uh, structure is always the same, but uh, the, the side chains differ. And uh, we wanted to see, um, is there any structure activity um, relationships is, and uh, concerning the, the length and the, the question uh, whether they are saturated um, or not, especially since uh, a number of, of bioactivities um, have been reported, um, and uh, we were interested in the antimicrobial um, activities. So we developed a process uh, for the isolation, fractionation of uh, alkanyl resorcinols. When you analyze them at once without uh, prior prior um, uh, purification, you end up with a with a really busy chromatogram. Um, and uh, from from uh, lipid chemistry, we we know methods to separate uh, the the uh, saturated from unsaturated fatty acids, um, and this takes place in um, in the presence of uh, silver ions. Now the the problem is you have to get rid of the silver ions subsequently because when you have silver ions um, present and you do an antimicrobial assay, you might end up with, with artifact uh, uh, that the, the antimicrobial effect is not due to, to the compounds, but, but to, the, to the silver ions. So uh, we, we uh, uh, extracted uh, these compounds and did a deep bed filtration at minus 80 degrees centigrade. And uh, then we could separate the the uh, saturated from unsaturated um, alkanyl resorcinols. And then the, the chromatogram gets a bit less busy. We isolated uh, these compounds by semi-preparative um, HPLC, analyzed uh, these compounds uh, by UHPLC, and then we had an idea of, of the composition uh, of the, the alkanyl resorcinol uh, fractions, in this case of rye and, and um, wheat. This is uh, the growth, growth inhibition of uh, Fusarium species, Colmorum graminearum poe, uh, in the presence of uh, um, alkyl resorcinols or, uh, at, at uh, varying um, concentrations. And uh, you see that uh, the, the acetone extract and, uh, of wheat and wheat bran and retentates from wheat and rye caused the strongest inhibition um, of these uh, Fusarium species. What was really surprising was the fact that um, the growth inhibition was caused by saturated rather than by unsaturated alkanyl resorcinols. This is surprising because previous um, reports on the bioactivities actually pointed at a higher effect um, by, by unsaturated alkanyl resorcinols. Sometimes we got uh, negative values, which indicates uh, a growth promoting effect. No? Uh, we speculate that, that uh, it might have been caused by the presence of compounds that, that uh, facilitate um, growth. And of course, we were also um, interested in the, the question, is there a synergistic um, effect? How do individual 
um, alkanyl resorcinols um, affect uh, the, the growth of, of the Fusarium species. And you see we have a, a different uh, um, uh, response. Yeah? Um, it seems that with increasing chain length of the side chain, uh, the, the growth inhibition effect um, uh, is, is, is increasing. Yeah. And um, in case we we add we add uh, unsatur um, uh, unsaturated alkanyl resorcinols, uh, the the uh, growth inhibitory effect is is even antagonized. So it clearly tells us uh, we have uh, significant structure activity um, relationships uh, that have so far not been um, reported for alkanyl. Um, resource nodes. We moved on and uh, found that a compound, a, a hydroxyzinamic acid called ferulic acid, that is present in these serial side streams, uh, that it has uh, significant antimicrobial activities. Um, it's uh, used, for example, for the biotechnological production of uh, vanillin, because it has the this basic uh, structure of vanillin here in, in this phenolic part. And um, uh, we incubated um, grapes, red and, and white uh, grapes, with, with uh, uh, Botrytis cinerea. And uh, when we had applied an emulsion that contained ferulic acid before, um, we did not see a significant um, growth of, of botrytis, yeah? um, either in, in red grapes or white grapes. Yeah? And uh, of course, this, this is an interesting uh, result concerning the potential application of, of uh, uh, ferulic acid as a natural um, pesticide. I would like to, to show you some colors. Uh, when we convert uh, phenolic acids um, and uh, couple them with, with um, amino compounds, we can generate uh, nice colors, which may be of interest as, um, as natural uh, food colorants. The basic uh, chemistry that, that is underlying these, these reactions is the um, um, oxidation of orthodiphenols either enzymatically with polyphenol oxidase or chemically in the presence of oxygen. And then we obtain intermediates uh, that are called quinones, orthoquinones. Uh, the quinones are extremely uh, reactive um, intermediates because they are electron deficient and they may react with all types of nucleophiles in particular uh, with thiol groups from from amino acids but also with um, amino groups and uh, so it gives a diverse range of of reactions regimen products especially since they may uh, react also with themselves and and with other uh, phenolic um, compounds when you do this in the presence of amino acids you get this nice array of colors. In most cases, a green color um, is observed, uh, which goes back to uh, um, a class of compounds that is called benzacridines. Um, uh, these benzacridines are are green. Uh, they differ only in this in this um, residue R that comes from from the amino acids. And you see, with cysteine, we have no color with uh, most of these uh, amino acids, it's more or less green. And uh, with some, it's it's even red or it is uh, brown. And we can, we can uh, make use of this. Um, this is egg yolk, uh, foamed egg yolk uh, that I produced uh, and I added chlorogenic acid. And you see what happens. Um, based on these reactions that I uh, showed you in the in the previous slide, yeah, these this egg yolk reacts with chlorogenic acid yeah, to to um, these uh, green benzacridines. Yeah. So you can produce a green foam, and even the the drainage water um, that uh, comes out of this foam is intensely um, uh, green. So a nice uh, uh, game that you can can play, and uh, this is, would be a, 
an opportunity to replace chlorophyll, uh, which is uh, unstable uh, when it's deprived of, of its uh, natural matrix uh, to uh, buy, buy these uh, green benzacritines. Uh, it has triggered even more research. I showed you this array in an Italian group in, in Naples. They found uh, these types of, of red compounds when they analyzed uh, the, the structures. Uh, we came to a different uh, conclusion and uh, we, we, are, uh, we have structurally elucidated uh, another uh, compound and uh, currently the manuscript is in preparation. I'm confident that we can uh, submit it um, in, in December. Let me um, add that it does not necessarily take tryptophan uh, to obtain a red color. When you oxidize caffeic acid, uh, you end up also with a nice red um, color uh, without any amino acid. What looks like uh, chemistry, organic chemistry, has also an, an application in uh, animal sciences. Yeah. I, I did a project with my colleague Carla in Südikum um, on, on exactly this, this topic. Um, when you have um, ruminants, they, they ingest uh, proteins and uh, in the rumen there may be an excessive microbial um, degradation of, of crude uh, proteins and uh, this uh, leads to a decrease in, in protein utilization efficiency in the small intestine. Um, previous attempts uh, to, to inhibit uh, these, these uh, effects uh, are based on harsh chemistry, uh, heat, uh, treatment with, with formaldehyde, but there are safety concerns, the reactions are hard to control. And we did uh, exactly what we, what we did with this uh, green uh, foam uh, that I showed you previously. We did an alkaline um, treatment of uh, sunflower meal, which contains a lot of proteins, but also a lot of chlorogenic acids. Yeah. And uh, we saw again the, the formation of, of benzacridines. Yeah. So we derivatized, in other words, we derivatized uh, the, the protein, yeah? um, prevented it from microbial degradation in, in the rumen, and we could even show that in the intestine, uh, there is an increase in digestibility of alkali treated samples um, compared to, to untreated sunflower meal. So um, it seems that it's it's not necessarily related to, to Finoro, but but I would say there is a, a, a huge opportunity to, to pool uh, cross-disciplinary resources you know, to correlate sensor data with, with compounds that um, are relevant, especially for crop quality. We are mostly talking about crop yield, but especially high yields um, will be of little value when, when the quality of these crops is, is not okay. So uh, we can, we can uh, pool uh, these resources from food sciences and metabolomics, plant sciences uh, with robotics and sensor technology uh, in an effort to validate uh, the data that we obtain from, from non-destructive field measurements. Yeah. Um, we could add uh, the profile of individual compounds of valuable quality determining compounds uh, to the sum parameters that we usually get from, from uh, sensors. Yeah. And this may extend to, to the nutritional value, to, to technological and sensory properties um, up to uh, the question, are there any toxicological toxicologically relevant um, compounds. We already have an ongoing uh, project, uh, an open call project, quality assessment of aromatic plants by hyperspectral and mass spectrometric methods, uh, where Saskia Chiaparas is working in, in my group and Matthias's group. And um, there is even more to it. Um, grape phenolic maturity. When does uh, a wine grower uh, uh, have uh, to, to uh, harvest uh, the grapes in order to produce high quality wines, uh, what about plant stress detection, what is the effects of extreme temperatures, uh, keyword climate change on the metabolic um, response. And um, what I have seen so far is that there may be challenges in, in sensor measurement um, caused by the 
anatomical characteristics, let's say rough surfaces. And uh, the question is, can we compensate uh, this uh, by instrumental analysis? What I have also seen is that commercially available instruments uh, for non-destructive measurements is used not exclusively, but mainly for chlorophyll um, determination. And this is actually of limited importance in food science. So to conclude, um, I think there is really um, ample opportunities for, for cross um, disciplinary um, research activities. And I hope I, I could give you an, a, a little insight into uh, this really fascinating uh, field of research. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Andreas. Uh, I learned a lot. 